Hi, I'm Michelle Grizoulis and I'm president of the Foundations at Rochester Regional Health and I'm happy to be here with you today to talk a little bit more about COVID-19. And I first of all want to thank you both for being here and introduce you to our audience. I am joined today by Dr. Emil Lesho and Dr. Mary Rose Lagilovila. I practiced that before we went live, I apologize. Okay. Uh, they're both infectious disease physicians at Rochester Regional Health and with all the news that's out there, we thought that it was a good time for us to revisit some of the FAQs that are coming up and talk a little bit about some of the things that we're getting questions about. So that's the purpose of our Facebook Live today. So, Emil, I want to start with you and dive right in and talk a little bit about how the virus spreads and who's at highest risk. <clears throat> okay, it, the virus spreads much like the flu. Um, in terms of through the air, close contact through the air. So we like to use a rough cutoff of about six feet. So if you're close to somebody more than six feet and um, they're sneezing or they're coughing or they cough into their hands and they touch the doorknob and then soon thereafter you touch the doorknob and touch your face. So that's pretty much how it spreads. Um, and and the, the fancy term for that is large droplet spread. Um, who is at highest risk? Um, well, we're all at risk for getting infection, but, but the good news is that 80% of the infections have been mild. The people who are at highest risk for the worst outcomes are people that are over 60 that have other medical problems such as uh, asthma, emphysema, uh, diabetes, or the people who are more elderly um, but don't have many infections, so in short, the elderly. So we're going to talk in a few minutes about how to protect yourself, but I want to go back to what, to what you said about the droplets. So um, say a little bit more about how long the virus lives once someone sneezes or has those large droplets and they've been, they're, they're somewhere near you. What's the length of life? Well, there's, there are some good reports and some very rigorous scientific uh, uh, examples that the virus can live up to nine days on surfaces in the environment and in the hospital steel uh, countertops and stuff. Is that longer than like the flu virus or other? I, I don't know, okay. to be honest, but it's okay. like the flu. Um, it's like some bacteria, but fortunately the good news is that most, almost all the hospital cleaners and disinfectant that we use are very effective for it. Great, great, okay. Mary Rose, let's talk about symptoms. So what are the symptoms of COVID-19 and how are the symptoms that you might have for this different than what symptoms that you might have for the flu? Right. And just like how uh, Emil had alluded to, um, being a respiratory virus, the symptoms are similar to flu, but sometimes there are little distinctions. Okay. Uh, classically, flu is described as having a sudden onset, but what we see described from the infections in Asia have been more of a, a slower prodrome. It's not such sudden onset of full, full fatigue and body fatigue and fevers. Um, maybe more gradual, okay. generally starts as upper respiratory symptoms, okay. some runny nose, sore throat, and then the fevers can begin and they can be persistent for several days. Um, after that, if the patient or the individual doesn't clear the infection, it can lead to a lower respiratory tract disease where then you have the symptoms of pneumonia. So that might be difficulty breathing, uh, also a productive cough. Okay. and and. What should someone do if they start to feel like, okay, I have a, something's happening, I'm get, I have a runny nose, I have a sore throat. What's the first thing that you'd recommend that people do? Well, the first thing I would recommend to them is be conscientious of that there's still a low prevalence of infections locally. But if you have known somebody who is diagnosed as having COVID, or if you've been to any of the locations that have been identified by the WHO as, as high risk travel areas, uh, particularly in the last two weeks, then you might be more concerned that you do contract the infection. Now, this time of year, there are lots of other respiratory mm -hmm. infections that are circulating, still flu, other uh, respiratory viruses, other types of more benign coronavirus, rhinovirus. So if you play the odds and you haven't been to one of those locations, it's more likely that it's one of these passing respiratory infections. Should they call their primary care doc first before they head off to the ED? I think if you are one of those individuals, and feel free to chime in, if you're one of those individuals we highlight that are, are potentially at risk of having uh, complications, then you can call your doctor and also let them know in terms of how long have your symptoms been, okay. what have the symptoms been like, and um, 
If you've traveled to any of those places, let them know because potentially they might have a heightened awareness to screen you. I would like to, to highlight that what we also see in terms of symptoms is that GI symptoms are not as dominant as the respiratory symptoms in this coronavirus. Okay. Oftentimes for flu, they can have also GI upset and diarrhea, mm -hmm. but a lot of the reports from Asia show that the frequency in which people have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea are less than 10% of them. So that might actually be the flu, but because there's so much fear right now over COVID, people are assuming it's COVID. Correct. Okay. Dr. Lesho, how are we preparing at Rochester Regional Health? I think how, it's how, important to How share. much time do we have to answer <laughs> that question? Well, we have a few minutes, so let's, let's hit the highlights. Oh, very briefly, we're, Rochester Regional is taking it very seriously, and um, it, we have a multifaceted approach, um, beginning with an aggressive messaging and educational mm -hmm. campaign, hence, hence this venue. But we have uh, the team, special communications mm -hmm. uh, teams have been set up to assist with uh, educational materials and um, uh, venues. There is a COVID toolkit that's available on the portal. Um, uh, and there are uh, algorithms uh, and, and um, assistance, teaching assistance uh, that we're providing to all the members of the Pocasi, to all GRIPA. Uh, and to the in, inpatient areas. So for the listeners, because most of them probably aren't familiar with what PACASI or GRIPA is, let's just take a moment mm -hmm. and those are, can you describe what those two groups are so these it makes are, sense? These are uh, associations of, and Mary Rose can, can help out, these are associations for all the local physicians yep. who, are, who are part of Rochester Regional. Uh, Rochester Regional, we think, of, we think of the five hospitals, but there are hundreds of practices that are also involved and that we're also trying to educate what to do if somebody that has the symptoms that Dr. Lage Ovila described uh, shows up or they call and what. So the first part starts with an aggressive educational campaign. Mm -hmm. The second part starts with keeping uh, our, our providers and our patients safe as we can. Mm -hmm. And what that entails is uh, in, a robust infection control efforts. So we, we're on um, points of entry of the hospital, infection prevention and control, our meeting uh, with all the intake staff, with the, with the registrants, uh, and with the assistants to, to tell them what they should do if they suspect a patient might have this. Um, we are reviewing and enhancing all our infection control policies. Uh, this is a special challenge, as you can imagine, because these patients, even though they might be slightly more infectious mm -hmm. uh, than the flu, they still need the same care. Mm -hmm. So we still need to do CAT scans, and we still need to do the dialysis. So in addition to the general That's preparations right. that we're doing, we're meeting with each of those teams, each of those select populations to come up with tailored approaches uh, for, those, for those as well. Uh, we also, it's important, it's, it's, we also have a great relationship and we partner with the county and state health departments. And there's not a day that goes by that we're, we have not a call in, one or two calls a day in with the county and state health department. We also work closely with our sister hospital because the viruses don't know a border. They're not going to stop at Strong Memorial or they're not going to stop at Rochester mm -hmm. General. So we work closely with our counterparts at the university as well. Mm -hmm. We compare and enhance each of our approaches. Mm -hmm. Taking it to the, to the nth uh, degree, we're also preparing for worst case scenarios. Um, as you know, the hospital routinely is at overcapacity. So we have limited surge capacity. That said, we're planning for where we can expand, um, you know, special isolation rooms and just normal overflow rooms. Yeah. Mary Rose, anything you want to add to that? No? no. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure I didn't, I didn't uh, not ask the question. What does it mean when someone's quarantined? Because we hear that a lot right now in the media and I think and that's, it's helped. It's confusing and yeah. it's a very good question. So there are two types of quarantine. Um, and, and again, all this, much of the recommendations or the information that we present today will change because this is a rapidly uh, you know, evolving situation. There are, so there are two types of quarantine. One is mandatory quarantine that is enforceable with the state. It's, by law, it's enforceable. And that's, that was, for example, if you came back from one of the five countries and you screened positive on your travel entry mm -hmm. screen, um, then you were you would you were placed in one of those uh, locations in the mili you know on military installations, or you were you were quarantined uh, at other places. That's mandatory quarantine. 
The other type of quarantine that's more common is voluntary home quarantine. So it's important to emphasize this is voluntary. So we rely on, on the altruism mm -hmm. and, the, and, and the honor system of the, the people and the patients to, to, to honor that. Um, and that just means that you limit, you stay home for 14 days, you don't go to school or work. You can, you go to your, with the grocery store, but you don't go to unnecessary stuff. Okay. And if you leaving the area or if you do go or something, or you're in your monitor daily with, along with the health department. If you develop symptoms, you notify the health department if they haven't already notified you first. Okay, that's helpful. I want to pause for a moment because we have had some questions come in and I'd like to get them asked and then we can go back to sort of the list of questions I had before we started. So I'm pregnant, should I be worried about COVID? Okay, well, no, I think that's a fair question. Um, and there's limited data still. And on the one hand, I could say that although pregnancy isn't exactly an immunocompromising position, they, we know that they're vulnerable. And from at least seasonal flu, pregnant patients are at increased risk of adverse outcomes okay. related to the flu infection. However, because coronavirus is a, is a very different virus, could we possibly extrapolate the data we have for other coronavirus infections that we know we do have? And there isn't an, an adverse uh, outcome from pregnant women related to coronavirus otherwise itself. Okay. And it's not like Zika virus, where it's very clear that there are teratogenic connections. Um, so I would say that at this time, based on very preliminary data and knowledge of other coronaviruses, it's still important to just say, like, do your routine, as we're recommending to all other individuals, to minimize the risk of gathering the infection, okay. um, such as hand hygiene and social distancing. Okay. The next question, will the warm weather help? And I actually asked this question of somebody yesterday because I'm thinking most things start to die out as the weather gets warmer. Is that true for what we know about coronavirus? I don't think we know. Right. I, I don't think we know. Um, and we pose that same question during our educational things to our, okay. our, our virology experts, Dr. Walsh and Falsey. Their, their impression is that there's no reason to think that, that cases will not continue to increase, that suddenly we'll, we'll, we'll get into the season because this is the first emergence of the virus. And generally, it, it, it takes at least one year or more year before it establishes a cyclic nature or a seasonal nature. So it's quite possible that it will establish a seasonal nature, but like much like the pandemic influenza of 2009, that can, you had cases all the way through the summer. And it's too and, soon for the predictability. And that's what we expect yeah. with this. Okay. So the last question we have right now is someone's asking, I have other health issues. Should I stay inside as much as possible? And that sort of gets at that self-quarantine question or more of just I have, my, I have anxiety around my own health. What do I do? Right. I think that's a, a really good question. And, you know, I think it goes into any other question in terms of how can I protect myself? So it's understanding what your awareness of your own body is, mm -hmm. as well as your also your, your social awareness, I would think. So if you do have uh, concerns that you could be at risk, then um, I wouldn't strongly say, like, just stay home and not live your life, mm -hmm. but just be conscientious of what you do and where you go. You know, there's a, it's amazing how many uh, advantages today's society has for home delivery of groceries know, or of having telephone conversations and FaceTiming with friends. You can still socialize, but potentially um, at a distance, as well as if you know you're potentially going to be around other people who are sick, you can potentially choose to, to opt out of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, okay, And That's if these helpful. scenarios are unavoidable, you mm -hmm. know, that hand sanitizer, if you have it available, wash your hands, um, avoid touching your face or the T-zone and uh, uh, to minimize the ability to inoculate yourself with the virus right, are right. practices we should all be doing anyway. It's, it has surprised me how much since this all happened how much we've been reminded that hand washing is sort of the best, of, not touching your face and hand washing is in some ways the best defense. It, it is. It's, it's common it's, sense. It's boring, but it's back to the yeah. basics. A yeah, lot it of is really back, to, back the to the basics. You just answered one of the questions about protecting, how do I protect myself? Is there anything else that you'd want to say about folks, to folks listening about how to protect themselves before we move on? I, I would say that if you have at-risk family members, right, okay. and you're young and healthy yourself, but then you have maybe um, a cough, some shortness of breath, or definitely a fever. Don't visit your family yeah. members. Don't go visit your grandma or your grandfather. And that high risk group that you talked about in your first answer was individuals over 60? With, with comorbidities. With comorbidities then, like diabetes. Yes. Um, lung disease, lung disease, heart disease, okay. 
immunosuppressed patients, yeah. cancer, yeah. and then people, just the elderly patients. And elderly is, everybody has a different definition. I know. 70 and above. Yeah, okay, that's a good... That, but, but technically yeah. in, this, in the reports that are coming out, it's it definitely people that are 80 and above are definitely having worse outcomes if okay. they get infected. And it's not really affecting young kids like the flu does. Doesn't seem right. that way. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. Dr. Lesho, should I cancel travel if I have it planned? Uh, I, there's two ways to answer that question, and I think it, the, 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 the honest, the, you know, the interactive way is to say it depends on your tolerance for risk. Exactly. So if you're willing to um, undergo screening and be potentially quarantined when you come back into the country, and that's not a problem, or, yeah, or be told to stay at home for 14 days, um, or you might have to seek care in uh, another country, then if you're, if you're fine with that, uh, that would, if it were me, but then the other answer is I, when my friends and family ask me, should what about international travel? Uh, I'd say there's probably a better time than now to do international travel. So I was going to ask, would your answer change if it was in-country travel? So for example, if someone needs to go out to California for a meeting? Um, I, I, th I think a lot of conferences, right. including, including infectious disease yeah. and infection, have, not, have been right. canceled. So I wouldn't go for meetings, uh, I, but I... It depends on your purpose for travel. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, and so if, if you're going for business, is that arguably unnecessary? And yeah. could you do it remotely? If you were going to go in a place where, you know, it was heavily populated, then maybe you wouldn't want to be present among the other 5,000 people watching that sports show. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I'd say also the other thing is sometimes when you're traveling and you're going through a big hub, then you don't really know... What else is around mm -hmm. you? Now, there are a couple stu studies that showed that communicability within an airplane isn't exactly like absolute. Yeah. But again, it depends on the host. If it's somebody who right. is low risk and average age, and you want to see somebody who you care about, and you're avoiding large mm -hmm. locations, then it might be something that's reasonable. Yeah. I think uh, <coughs> another simple answer is if I had any of those comorbidities, I definitely wouldn't travel to yeah. a high risk area. Yeah. You know? And I think what you said before is important is what's what's your individual level right. of tolerance for risk right. and potential outcome of having to be quarantined because there are no absolutes right now that we know of. Right? And, and that's an important thing we should point out to our employees. Um, if you, uh, our policy right now is that if you come back from a high risk a area and what is high risk? High risk is what's on the CDC website as a level two and higher advisory. And so right now, for example, there's potentially five countries on there, and the list is probably growing. So if you're an employee and you came back from any of those five countries, level two and above, you would be furloughed for 14 days. Mm -hmm. And are there any high-risk areas in the United States right now that have been identified that you know of? Any portions of our country? I take that one. Well, I guess uh, New Rochelle is the closest one I'd be okay. most worried about. Um, and New Rochelle is a, a very finite small town, mm -hmm. though, so I think if you went any other place in New York State, depending on what you were doing, um, it's probably low risk. Okay. Um, I would be <coughs> thinking twice if there are individuals who are in Seattle, knowing how many cases they've been identifying out mm -hmm. there. Um, but other than those two, there mm -hmm. haven't been exactly other cities that I are... That's what I would agree with, Washington and uh, you know, New York City environment. Good information. It's, try, it's, it's helpful to dispel what is sort of... Uh, fact from fiction. This is a really sort of housekeeping question, no pun intended, but what's the best way to clean surfaces? Um, what should people be thinking about how to keep you know, their office clean? I came in this morning and Cloroxed my phone and my desk and with a Clorox wipe. Other things that people should be thinking about? Can you get a Clorox wipe anymore? Well, I happen to have a container in my <laughs> office <laughs> and I could sell those right now for a lot of money. <laughs> I, I don't remember mm -hmm. with all the exact listing of chemicals, but the best, but the best disinfectants and sterilizers were bleach, so okay. Clorox wipe, okay. right. followed by hydrogen peroxide. That's what hospital uses. Okay. Um, followed by um, alcohol, seventy percent alcohol, and I, and and I'm, I don't know if anybody did a head-to-head -head comparison, but these the, the, oh. the Wegmans disinfectant wipes have yep. disinfectants in, so they're probably they're probably just as fine as well. Okay. If you it, if if it gets short and you can't buy the wipes, are really convenient. But you could always get Clorox and make a bucket of water. Um, look right, up the recipe. Them. Maybe right. you know the recipe, yeah. uh, like a te teaspoon in a in a gallon or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I can't remember what it is, but yeah. you're right. And right. I think people forget that right. because right. Uh, right convenience. We don't convenience. Know, right? I know. I know. 
And also just be conscientious <coughs> of the high touch surfaces. Right. You know, you That's don't need a great to do point. like every single corner, but yeah. you know, right. telephones, doorknobs, door elevator yeah. buttons. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Someone was saying you should use your elbow for all right. the stuff that you. <laughs> right. you know, some real basic stuff, but things that. Because right. I also don't think we're conscious of how frequently we touch our face. Agreed. And, right? and if you put a mask on and you don't need to wear a mask, you're going to touch your face even more. Exactly. Exactly. And thereby increasing your risk. So. Yeah. So we're almost done because I also want to be mindful that you two mm -hmm. have other stuff that you could be doing right now with your day. But I think this is a general question for both of you. So I'll start with you, Mary Rose. What should I do if I think I'm infected? I know you said call PCP, but I think mm -hmm. this is kind of, you know, the salient. What do I do so that I don't panic? Right. Well, I would say, well, if, if I did think that I was sick, I, in my mind, I'd probably really retrace my steps. Okay. Was I ever exposed to someone who potentially could be mm -hmm. COVID? Okay. Because if you weren't, then the risk becomes really zero. It's not known to be circulating in our location. So if there are individuals who are not around anyone who has yeah. been uh, on quarantine or had traveled anywhere that okay. was of, of note, mm -hmm. um, then I'd, I'd feel more comfortable ruling myself out. Okay. Um, if if myself was somebody who did have respiratory symptoms and I was concerned and I uh, have also comorbid conditions, those are the same conditions that make you more risk for bad outcomes from flu. So I think then it should make me, prompt me to, to call my doctor and say, okay, I am concerned about this, but is there something else that we could potentially do? Because at least an advantage for flu is that there's, a, there's an antiviral for yeah. flu. Yeah, okay. There's another important point. We might be facing a shortage of personal protective equipment. Mm -hmm. And as uh, Mary Rose was alluding to, um, the flu is still out there and it's, it's doing a lot of damage. And five or six or maybe seven people were killed already in Monroe County because of the flu. Fortunately, we have no cases of COVID in Monroe County yet. But so it's never too late to get the flu mm -hmm. shot. Number two, as it relates to conservation of masks, the state requires all healthcare workers who have refused to get the flu vaccine uh, to wear a mask. We are considering if how can we mitigate that, right? So we're using something like at RRH up to a thousand masks a day in response to the people who have not gotten the flu shot. So we would ask you to definitely get the flu shot. Everybody's worrying about a vaccine. You hear the administration say, where's the vaccine, where's the vaccine? We have a vaccine yeah. for the flu and you can't get people to take it. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. That must frustrate you guys given what you do. Truly, and I, I, I value that. So, Phil, questions? Yeah. Okay, I'm just gonna rattle these off and I'll let you guys decide who wants to answer them. How long are people contagious? I think we might have said this, but go for it. Um, they are uh, contagious generally as long as they're really symptomatic. So people who are known to be colonized but asymptomatic haven't been identified as giving it to somebody else just yet. But they're most contagious if they're coughing, they have these large droplets that are getting projected out of their body and onto the surfaces or the next person. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna ask you to break down what you said so, okay. so that for lay people like myself, when you say someone who's colonized, meaning it's someone who's been exposed. exposed so they were near they, someone who had it. Correct. Okay. And they may have the virus on them, okay, but they're not coughing that virus, getting it to the next yes. person. Yes, so they haven't developed symptoms, but they're carrying it. Correct. That's what you mean by asymptomatic. Right. Okay. Okay. So really, there's no. We don't know how long someone's contagious. It depends. Mm -hmm. Is the is the is the real I, answer? I think a general ballpark is as she said, but um, as long as you're symptomatic, definitely. We know definitely how long you're contagious. As long as you have symptoms and as long as you're having fevers. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. The next question: I have diabetes. How do I protect myself? I'm looking at you, Dr. Oh, me? <laughs> Any I, one of you. Again, <laughs> back to the basics. The first thing is try to keep your, sh your sugar under the best control you can because um, when, when your diabetes is out of control, that impairs your ability to fight any type of infection, okay. not just this. Um, if, you're, if you're in that age group, like 60, and you have diabetes, I would, I would restrict my travel. I would not uh, um, you know, go uh, indefinitely in crowds. Okay. Sorry, I'm on call. That's okay. He's, Dr. Lesh is on call, which is what you hear. So we're just going to let that just... Yeah, take, take. If you need to go take call, go ahead. I can find it. I can find okay. it. I can shut it off. <laughs> Sorry. This is happening in real time. It's live. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, so my spouse has health issues, and I work in a grocery store. Am I putting my spouse in danger? I think we've talked a little bit about this, but let's try to answer that direct question. 
for the for the benefit of the person who wrote in. I work in a grocery store. Mm. You want to take a crack? Well, I, I think the, you know, the the best way to, to mitigate well on that one. Yep. Well, the, the best way to mitigate transmission to your spouse would be mitigating for anyone you work closely with, and right. it's just the general hygiene: coughing into your elbow or into a tissue and then discarding it, because the contact really needs to be with those the the respiratory droplets like the secretions. So let me let me ask that in a way that I think someone might be thinking about it too. I work in an area where I come in contact with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I might not feel different. I right. might not have been exposed. Can I go home and give my spouse a kiss and not worry that I've infected them even if I don't feel anything? So how do we help people not get sort of out of kilter on something right. like that? Well, be extra judici judicious mm -hmm. with hand hygiene. Okay. Right. Okay, that's helpful. I mean, I think that's. I think people are at the level now where they're thinking, God, everything I touch, no, I'm going to infect. We, we had a question, can I get it from money? Can I get it from touching all these services? See? I mean, you have to go on with your normal life, and you can't let it restrict it. But that said, the, as Dr. Lagio Vila said, what, bef as I got home, I'd wash my hands frequently. Um, and, uh, you know, if you get the sniffles, you, it's not really the sniffles that this mm -hmm. is. It's more like a lower respiratory. But if you get symptomatic, then definitely, you know, uh, distance yourself from your spouse okay. until you find out what it is. And by distance, I mean, you know, not a lot of close contact yeah. and stuff like that. But if you're asymptomatic, normal hand hygiene. Okay. So I want to wrap up, but I, and Phil, I want to wrap up with the last question that you've asked, so I'll come back to that. I promise I won't forget it. Um, but I want to give people some resources. So one of the places that people can go if you have, in, if you have questions is to visit rock health, I'm sorry, rock.health forward slash COVID-19. That's rock.health forward slash COVID-19. And that's where a lot of information uh, is available for you if you have questions. And this is a question I want to ask both of you before I finally wrap it up. But I, was, I got a notification today from Wegmans that they're sort of starting to ration toilet paper, paper towels. Uh, I was at a Target over the weekend and there wasn't a, a hand sanitizer to be found in the store. Are people un, uh, um, panicking in a way that they don't need to about toilet paper, paper towels, Kleenex, those sorts of things? I mean, how do we help people get sort of rational about that right hmm. well okay. I think I think um, as you mentioned earlier uh, the most important ration is your prescription medicines mm -hmm. right. so do what you need to do to have a supply of, and we understand that that's hard because as you know if you have a prescription plan you, you can't get refills until you're like almost at the end of that refill so uh, the government is supposed to be looking into that but that's the most important thing um, I, what, I, what I recommend is if you're there, uh, I, no, I don't think we should go into panic shopping like this. And I've seen yeah. these things on social media. Yeah. But at the same time, you might have to be prepared for being in your house for 14 days. So you might, you know, I wouldn't go out of my way, but as I'm doing my routine shopping, maybe I put an extra TV mm -hmm. dinner, maybe I grab an extra... A bottle of water or an extra six pack of something. Yeah. Um, but I don't, I wouldn't go crazy. Yeah. Right. Common sense. Right. Um, and I think the time limit is very important. Mm -hmm. So generally, if somebody's identified as being a, a suspicious uh, infected person, then the quarantine's for 14 days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not indefinite. Right. It's not that you're right. not going to be able to be out of your house. Right. And we also are very fortunate to have a lot of delivery services. Yeah. Right, that's yeah. a great point. Amazon's, so, I'm sure. Instacart been, is amazing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody says that even there well There you before go. All the more reason not to do panic shopping. <laughs> that's true. Okay, so let's let's try to wrap up because mm -hmm. there's so much information out there and it is overwhelming for people to sort of make sense of all of it. But let's 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 end by reiterating how how do you catch it? How is it transmitted? Right? Because I think that brings people back to the basics of how to protect myself. Good, it's, it's spread through droplet precautions, mm -hmm. through coughing near people, through sneezing near people, through coughing and on surfaces and having somebody touch that surface and then touch their mucous membranes. Yeah. Most important message we'd like to get out is if you're sick and you have a fever, don't go to school or work. If you're going to seek health care, contact your provider first mm -hmm. and please let them know that you have respiratory symptoms or that Absolutely. you have a fever. Please let them know if you know you've had contact with a confirmed case. Um, in addition to the resource that you mentioned, um, you, can go, you can go on the county uh, health um, website. website and you can go on the CDC website and they're packed with information as well. There's, we get much of the information that we put on, on the link that you gave uh, from those websites yeah. as well, from the experts, and there's, a, there's sometimes a little delay. So they're, okay. they're also good in, information sources as well. Is there anything I didn't ask that the two of you would say, hey, 
this is really important. And there may not be anything, I just want to make sure. It's not too late to get your flu shot. I, yeah, I agree. And I did a Facebook Live last week and that was some of the messaging in that too, so it's not too late to get your flu shot. So first of all, thank you both for joining, joining for us. It's nice you. to meet you both. Thank you for the work you do on behalf of Rochester Regional Health and in your chosen profession. We're grateful that there are infectious disease physicians out there taking care of us and looking out for this stuff. Thank you all for joining. Encourage you to continue to ask questions and use the resources that we've provided. And I look forward to updating you again soon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Lots of information.